First, I want to say thank you to all uh, the men who have faithfully proclaimed the Word of God this week. It's, it's been a profound feast for me, and uh, I know it, it has for you as well. And I count it a great privilege to be among them and to be able to speak to you. There is a, more than a message on my heart, there's a category of evangelism that I think gets overlooked. And I, I want to share with you a text of Scripture that I think addresses that, at least in, in one place, and a few other Scriptures added on. But before I do that, if I may uh, be a, a little bit autobiographical, I, I'm not really given to this, but I, I think it might help uh, to uh, get a running start. I grew up in a pastor's house. I grew up in a typical sort of revivalistic, fundamental church. My dad loved the Lord, loved the Bible. I assumed that everybody in the church was saved. That was an assumption. I, I assumed that if you walked an aisle, signed a card, or prayed a prayer, you were saved. In high school, I began to question the salvation of people in leadership in my dad's own church. It just didn't seem to me that their lives necessarily bore testimony to what they professed. I knew there was something deeper and more real than what I saw in people's lives, and I didn't know where to go to find it. I actually found some books, some mystical books, as early as junior high, I was reading things like The Imitation of Life and books by E.M. Bounds and reading about people who got on their knees and prayed and wore grooves in the floor and just wondering where this real spirituality was. I was sort of uh, raised in, I guess, what you might call decisional evangelism with the raised hands and the walking aisles and kneeling benches and very undefined doctrine of salvation, justification, sanctification. I watched people who, while they were in the church, created doubt in my mind as to their true salvation, and there was no doubt when I watched them leave the church. My closest friend, or one of them in high school, he played in the backfield with me on the football team. He and I used to go down to Pershing Square in the city of Los Angeles and, and witness to people, talk to people in the park there about Christ. And we graduated together, and he went on to college and declared himself an atheist. I didn't have a category for Ralph. I went to seminary. I went to college, rather. Another buddy co-captain football team again, running in the same backfield. His name was Don, and he, he was headed for seminary, he said. He and I led a Bible study, and he graduated and went off and got a Ph.D. in philosophy and denied the faith and was arrested for lewd conduct. And I really didn't have a category for him. I went to seminary, had another friend, he was the, the son of one of the leading faculty members, my professor, who after he graduated set up a Buddhist altar in his house. I just really didn't understand it. When I came to my final year in seminary, I had to pick a thesis subject for my MDiv. And there was no choice for me. I, I wrote on Judas because I couldn't understand him either. I couldn't understand anybody who walked away from Christ. I couldn't understand how Judas, three years in the presence of Christ, could walk away from Christ and betray him. I just couldn't comprehend it. I, I watched the exploding Billy Graham organization having crusades all over the world and people pouring down aisles and never being found in churches and 
having the organization confess that they weren't sure how many of those people were really converted. And I came to Grace Church after seminary, and I was still so burdened by this. On my first Sunday at Grace Church, first Sunday morning, first sermon ever preached there, February 9th, 1969, I preached on Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. Within months, it became clear that there were elders, deacons, choir members, all kinds of people who didn't know the Lord. A year after that, a book came out written by the rather eccentric Lutheran theologian John Warwick Montgomery called Damned Through the Church. Wow. And he chronicled the history of damning heresy from the Reformation on that affected the church and damned people in the church. Damned through the church. I began to realize very early in my ministry at Grace Church that I needed to do the work of an evangelist in the church. When Paul wrote to Timothy, Timothy was pastoring the church at Ephesus, he said, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Somebody has to reach the unreached. I'm trying to reach the reached. I began to question things like the four law book, Jesus is Savior but not Lord. What is this carnal Christian? I wrote a little book called Kingdom Living Here and Now on the Beatitudes, which upset a lot of people. I wrote another book, Gospel According to Jesus, addressing the issue of genuine salvation, then another one, the Gospel According to the Apostles, then another one, Ashamed of the Gospel, then the Truth War, Hard to Believe, the Jesus You Can't Ignore, and it keeps going. I think the Lord, in a way, has kind of grooved me to evangelize the church. And I don't think we think about that. You know, I just, I grew up with the assumption that if you walked an aisle and prayed a prayer, you were in. Regardless of what your life was like, oh, hopefully, you would, um, hopefully you would make Jesus Lord at some point. I was at a conference at Moody early in my ministry, and I had five days of a session, and I was teaching this at Moody, and I was followed by a guy who was teaching the absolute opposite, who literally said, you know, enjoy your life. You can think about making Jesus Lord maybe in your 30s. You would know him if I named him. I don't know if you think about evangelism in the church. Let me tell you something. Hell will be far worse for the reached people than it will ever be for the unreached. Far worse. And I fear that the failure to confront on this issue is more common today in churches that feature a cheap gospel, a glitzy pop Jesus, and whose people are not regularly confronted about the legitimacy of their profession, not regularly warned about the most eternally devastating of all sins knowing the gospel and walking away. So maybe that helps explain me a little bit and why I always seem, even up to strange fire, always seem to be burdened to correct 
gospel errors that infect the church. Maybe I'm just an evangelist to the church. That's not all. The passion of Grace Church is, is for the whole world. And, but for me, this seems to be the little emphasis that God laid on my heart. Hebrews 10, 19, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Verse 23, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as the habit of some is, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near, because the day drawing near means judgment, and if you're not genuine, you're going to get caught in that judgment. I appreciate what you said, John. If you don't pursue holiness in your life, you're going to hell. Personally, it is beyond comprehension to me, it always has been, to grasp anybody walking away from Christ. It, it is, in my experience, the most heartbreaking part of pastoral ministry. I can deal with the dying children. I can deal with the broken uh, um, hearts of people who lose a spouse or lose a child. Uh, I, I can deal with all the diseases. I can, I can deal with all the struggles of life. There is a profound pain in my heart when somebody just turns his or her back on Christ and walks away. I deal with it all the time, all the time. It's not rare, it's common, it's common. Because it is, I fear the eternal undoing of all the good hope and all the warnings that we've tried to give, sometimes for years and years. Open your Bible to John 6. Actually, Dr. Moeller asked me if I would speak on John 6. Thank you, sir. John 6, uh, this is a challenge for me. There are 71 verses. <laughs> that is at least a 40-sermon series, as you might say. Let me read verses 60 to the end. I just, uh, just, I want you to feel the pain of our Lord here. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard message. Who can hear it? But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he was saying, for this reason I have said to you, that no one can come to me unless it's been granted him from the Father. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So Jesus said to the twelve, you do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil. Now, he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he was one of the twelve. 
and he was going to betray him. Look at verse 66 for a moment. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. Very strong language, very strong in the original language. It expresses finality. The same phrase, aista apizo, appears in Luke 9:62, where it says, uh, once starting but turning back, one is unfit for the kingdom. This is that kind of turning back. What is tragic about this is they are disciples, and there were many of them. John later describes such false followers who abandoned the Lord Jesus in his first epistle. He says, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they are all not of us. We know that verse, 1 John 2, 19, but do we know the verse before? The verse before calls them antichrists. Antichrists. Now, some people who defect from Christ in the heart, we won't know because only the judgment will reveal it. It will be revealed for some, on that day, as Matthew 7 says, on that day. On the day when the final judgment comes at the end of the Sermon on the Mount and smashes the house without a foundation. On that day when the angels, at the behest of God, separate the wheat from the tares. But until that day, we may not know. We may not know. But in this case, and in sadly many cases, we do know. I've stayed at Grace Community Church now since 1969, which is like a death sentence for those people. Please, please, Lord, call him somewhere else. I have stayed long enough to see the fruitless soil that looked good for a while, and as our Lord says in Luke 8:13, they believe for a while. I've seen them come and go and come and go and come and go under the most faithful, loving congregation, under the most firm and clear biblical preaching, the half-converted who can't handle any tribulation, the half-converted who can't loosen their grip on sin, who can't let go of the world, who can't let go of money, who can't let go of the culture, the half-converted, I have reminded them through the years repeatedly of 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 12, the example of unfaithful Israel in the desert. Let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. I have cried out to them from Colossians chapter 1 that yes, the work of Christ on the cross is applied to you if you remain faithful. Every time I have called them to the Lord's table, hundreds and hundreds of times through the years, I have asked them to examine themselves because a man must examine himself. I have poured out my heart on 2 Corinthians 13, 5. I have said, test yourself. Examine yourself, whether you're in the faith. Test yourself. I have gone through the warnings of Hebrews in chapter 2, in chapter 3, in chapter 4, in chapter 6. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? If it was horrendous for those who ignored the law, what's it going to be for those who ignore the gospel? I, I have reminded them so often, and you can turn with me of Hebrews 10, Hebrews 10, which I read a little earlier, I want to pick up where I left off, verse 23, I've reminded them of how important it is to hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. God will be faithful, but you must hold fast the confession 
And then I've reminded them of verse 26, which is the reality of apostasy. If we go on sinning willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. What is apostasy? It is going on in the unbroken pattern of corrupt sinfulness after receiving the knowledge of the truth. That's the fact of apostasy. What is the result of apostasy? There's no remaining sacrifice for sin. There is only a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. How much, verse 29, severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? I don't know any stronger words than that to say to a church. The writer of Hebrews said it to an assembly of people who constituted a church. What are the results of apostasy? Unparalleled punishment in hell. Vengeance. I will repay. The Lord will judge His people. Do you know why Isaiah talks about tears and wailing? Do you know why Jeremiah weeps? Do you know why Jesus weeps over Israel in Luke 19? Because those who have the most spiritual privilege suffer the greatest eternal punishment if they reject it. Verse 31, this is a message for the church. This is written to a group of people gathered in the name of Christ. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God, especially terrifying if you know the truth, especially terrifying. Verse 35, sum it up, therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, Hmm. You have need of endurance, perseverance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. You know how to get what was promised in eternity? Endure, persevere, and do the will of God. For yet, in a very little while, this all comes from the Old Testament, he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. Oh, my. And if he what? If he defects, if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction. What a horrible statement. But of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. That brings us to the subject, again, of our text. False disciples who shrink back to eternal destruction, true disciples who persevere in faith to the end. Now let's go back to John 6. I don't know if you preach that way in your church, but you should. Come back to John 6. This is such a, I, I just, just a painful text. Powerful, yes. Sorrowful, yes. Almost pathetic, poignant. As we survey the chapter just briefly, I want you to start at verse 66. Many of his disciples withdrew and we're not walking with him anymore. What's the pathology of that? How does that happen? Let's look at the character of false disciples. Something of the pattern or the pathology of it. Everything really began, wow, it began so wonderfully. Go back to the beginning of the chapter. The miracle meal, right? Miracle meal. 
All four Gospels record this, which caps off the Galilean ministry, and is the most um, extensive miracle Jesus ever did in terms of the number of people who participated. It's one thing to heal a blind man and a deaf person, something else to feed 20 to 25,000 people who all participate in the miracle. This is amazing. Matthew says that Jesus saw the crowd, verses 1 and 2 talk about the crowd gathered around the sea uh, in Galilee large crowd. Matthew says the Lord looked at them and saw them as sheep without a shepherd and felt compassion, tender love. Mark and Luke say he, he was so compelled and so compassionate that he just launched his healing power and healed all of them. Just healed all of them. His heart must have been overwhelmed with joy. His compassion, you have compassion, you can't do anything about it. David says, I'm climbing around in Tibet, right? My heart is aching. I can't do anything. Can't fix anything. Can't help anybody. Can't talk to anybody. Can't solve the problem. Short term, long term. Jesus could. And what joy did he get from doing that? All started so wonderfully. Massive crowd. We begin right there in the high moment of that day to begin to see the pattern of false disciples form. First thing, false disciples are attracted by a crowd. False disciples are attracted by a crowd because people are attracted by the dynamics of a crowd. Most people follow a crowd even when they have no idea what the crowd is Therefore, right? What do you do when you see a crowd? Go the other way? I don't think so. What do people do driving down the highway when they see a crowd of people off the road? They slow down, stop. We're drawn by a crowd. Crowds have an energy of their own. Whether it's a whether, whether it's a spontaneous kind of incident that has drawn people or you know, whether it's a rock church or a, a rock uh, concert or a mega church, crowds, uh, the anonymity of crowds, the excitement, the energy of crowds, the, the, the interest of crowds becomes attractive to people's sort of mundane lives. You could say the bigger the crowd, the more likely you are to get people who, uh, who are only drawn by the crowd. Second thing, False disciples can be fascinated by the supernatural. I, I think our whole culture is bizarre. They're so caught up in the supernatural. I, I, can, I can't watch anything on television but news or a sporting event because I can't live in the fantasy world. I can't live with weird, unreal beings that dominate television. I have no interest in that. But there's a, a fascinating kind of a fascinating escape mentality in our culture. The fascination with the supernatural. I think in ancient times, people would be fascinated by the prospect of something supernatural. People are still fascinated by the promise of the supernatural, even from people who can't pull it off. Fake miracles. But here's the real deal. You've got to know that Jesus' uh, power over demons, disease, death, and nature was fascinating. You do understand, of course, that that had never happened in the history of the world. There is a kind of danger when Jesus is popular, and when you promise the supernatural, people are desperately captive to the mundane. And his power, just think about his power. I asked a scientist in our church, I said, um, how much power would it take to make a half pound meal for 20,000 people? Calculate that. So he said, okay, E equals MC squared, which means energy equals mass plus the speed of light squared. A quantum of light carries energy that's converted to mass. So he said, 
the energy for a half pound meal for 20 people would be this. He went back, calculated, came to me and said, all the electrical power on earth operating at 100% output for 100% of the time for 4,000 years. That's pretty good. <laughs> so I said, okay, that was no big deal for Jesus. Because, listen to this, he created the sun. The sun consumes approximately 600 million tons of matter per second. Do you get that? The sun consumes 600 million tons of matter per second, generating enough energy in that one second to supply all the U.S. needs for 13 billion years. That did not come from some oozing mud with an amoeba in it. <laughs> the display of power, ah, they couldn't calculate that, obviously. Jesus drew these massive crowds, supernatural wonders. People want that. Simon Magus, he would pay for it. How much? The pull is strong. It's so strong toward the supernatural as a way out that fakers are successful at it. Promised miracles draw a crowd, huge crowds. Jesus could really do it. But when that kind of crowd gets together, the third element in this kind of pathology shows up. Uh, verse. 14, um, it says, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet, that's from Deuteronomy 18, the promise of the prophet like Moses, this is the prophet or the Messiah who is to come into the world. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. The third thing is they... they they want worldly benefits. The crowd wants worldly benefits. They want to make him king. This is carnal enthusiasm. This is free food permanently. What he had just done is a taste of what he could continue to do. Desire for comfort, desire for provision, desire for freedom from the difficulty of the battle for bread. What can he do for us? This is a staggering prospects for what his power could do for them temporally. This is like offering people the prosperity gospel. It works on natural desire. And they get bold about it. They, they become demanding to him in verse uh, 28. Drop down to verse 28. They said to him, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? I don't know if you know what that is saying, but this is what they're saying to Jesus. Give us the power. This is not a spiritual question. Give us the power. Simon Magus, we want to be able to do that. We want to be able to speak these things into existence. We, we want to be able to create our own world, create our own fulfillment. We want to be miracle workers. Jesus responds in verse 29 and says, the only uh, participation you'll ever have in a miracle is the miracle of believing in Him whom He sent. The work of God is to believe. Miracles were confined to Jesus and the apostles to start with. But Jesus is saying here, there is a miracle you can participate in. There is a work of God that you can participate in. It's faith, believing. Jesus constantly called them to believe. Repeatedly, I'm not going to read all of this, but all the way through this text, all the way down to verse 47, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life, always calling for faith. So they said, give us the power, give us the power. He says, you're not going to get the power. The only, the only participation you'll have in the power of God, the only time you'll be engaged in the work of God is when you believe on him whom he sent. 
So they said to him, if you're not going to give us the power, then what are you going to do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? If you're not going to give us the power, then you've got to keep giving us the provision. You, you, you've got to keep doing what we want you to do. What work are you going to do to validate yourself? Well, you say, that, that's, that's bizarre. Because he, he's just created a meal. Does he have to validate himself? Do you, do you have to do something more than that so that we might believe? Yeah, they diminish the miracle he had just performed. They dimin Here's how they diminish it. In verse 31, they say, that's no big deal. Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. Gave him bread out of heaven. Every day. For years. You want to prove to us that you're the prophet? One isn't going to do it. You've got to, you've got to give it to us all the time. Verse 34, Lord, always give us this bread. You, you've, got to, you've got to be at least equal to Moses in the wilderness. You've got to deliver every single day. the pattern of the false disciple drawn by the crowd, fascinated by the supernatural, sees a means to have his personal temporal desires fulfilled and starts making demands on God and expects God to validate who he is by meeting his demands. And Jesus launches into the really amazing uh, sermon on the bread of life and we come to a couple of other things that characterize these false disciples. They have no real interest in the Lord Jesus. They have no real interest in the Lord Jesus. We skipped a little section from verse 16 to 21. That's a little section of Jesus walking on the water overnight. And do you remember that? Do you remember the, the comment of Matthew in Matthew 14? Where when, when, when they met Jesus there, it says they worshipped him and said, you are certainly God's son. Remember that? The true disciples, they acknowledged who he was. They had interest in the Lord Jesus. Uh, they, they, they were those uh, people in the Matthew 13, 44 to 46 parable who sold all to buy the field to get the treasure, who sold all to buy the pearl of great price. But the crowd, they, they have no interest in Jesus. Jesus says in verse 35, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you, you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. This is the issue. Sure, they're attracted by the crowds. Of course, they're fascinated by the supernatural. Yes, they want power and provision, miracle power and all the provision they can get to satisfy their carnal desires. But no interest in Christ as the bread of life. No soul interest in him. Jesus talks about that further, as you know, and finally comes into verse 51 where he says, I'm not just the bread of life. I am the bread who will give his life for the world. And now he's talking about the cross, and he says, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. This is atonement. And now it's about sin and repentance and substitution and imputation and personal appropriation of that. You've got to embrace the cross. They have no interest in Christ. They have no interest in the cross. The cross is an offense. It is a stumbling block. Oh, well, here's the pathology leading up to our text drawn by the crowd, fascinated by the prospect of the supernatural, desiring worldly benefits, demanding their requests be met, having no true interest in Christ, and rejecting totally the notion of atonement. Verse 59, he said this in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Hmm. Tell you something, folks, that was a serious day. Oh, that was such a serious day. That may have been the most serious day for souls ever. Listen to Matthew eleven twenty three. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? 
you will descend to Hades. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable. What? Hell will be more tolerable for the homosexuals in Sodom who tried to rape angels than it will be for the religious Jews in Capernaum who rejected Jesus Christ. The defection came fast, verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard message, a hard teaching, most translations say. Who can hear it? Hard is scleros, scleros, dried out, stiff, sclerosis. Figuratively, it means unpleasant, objectionable, find a lot of ways to develop synonyms, offensive, unacceptable, harsh, violent, fierce, defiant, repulsive. The bottom line is, the NAS says, this is a difficult statement, please give me more than that. That is not what it is saying. This is not a difficult, this isn't confusing to them, it's crystal clear to them. One lexicon says the term scleros used figuratively means grating to the mind. Lagos, translated statement, is misleading. This isn't a statement, this is a message. We would say we want to hear a word from heaven. We don't mean pink. We don't mean a word, we mean a word. A discourse. This is a grating, irritating, unacceptable discourse. Who can hear this? What irritated them? He said he came down from heaven. He said he is the only true food for the soul giving eternal life. He said he would die as an atonement and a sacrifice for sinners. That's a very grating message. Nothing that he did offended them. Everything he said offended them. Okay, based on what he did, we declare he's a prophet. Nicodemus said it for those who were not true believers in John 2 and John 3. We know you're a teacher come from God. That's not enough. He didn't claim to be a teacher come from God. He claimed to be God. He claimed to be eternal from heaven, the source of life, the Son of Man, the Son of God, the one who alone grants eternal life, the one who personally raises the dead, the one who provides atonement for sin. All this from the mouth of a local carpenter from Nazareth who looked just like everybody else. Now let me get to the point. Here's the issue. Words. Words. Sometimes you hear this crazy statement. Preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. I don't know who said that. And I don't want to attribute it to the wrong person because it's so stupid. <laughs> you can't preach the gospel without words. That's a lie. Preach the gospel and always use words. Of course, now listen, of course people welcome you when you feed them. Of course they welcome you when you give them medicine and you heal them. Of course that is true. But don't be under the delusion that because you get a welcome response to the easiest kind of service, giving people exactly what they need and what they want to survive in the world, don't be confused that that is in any way going to mean they will respond when you do the hard work of evangelism and call them to repentance and faith. They will not reject you for your works, but they will reject you for your words. You still do the works, but don't assume there's an immediate connection. Listen to Jesus in John 8. 
So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you're truly disciples of mine. You'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Back in verse 30, as he spoke these things, as he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. As he spoke these things, further into the 8th chapter, verse 37, I know you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I've seen with my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your father. You remember this dialogue very well. He comes all the way down to saying, you're of your father, the devil. And then in verse 45, but because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Because I speak the truth. Verse 47, he who is of God hears the words of God. Luke 4, Jesus went back to Nazareth to the synagogue he grew up in. He said he'd basically come to preach the gospel, fulfill Isaiah 61. And he said the gospel is for the poor, prisoners, blind, and oppressed. His words so offended them, by the time he was done, they tried to throw him off a cliff, kill him. First, you know, they said, why don't you just do all the miracles here that you did in Capernaum? We want the miracles. The words will kill you. Oh, by the way, look at chapter 7, verse 1. End of the verse. The Jews are seeking to kill him. Look at chapter 8, verse 59. They picked up stones to throw at him. Finally, they did. It's always the words. Verse 61, so Jesus conscious, please note that his disciples, wow, his students grumbled, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? This message? Are you going to stumble over this? Well, of course they did. It's a stumbling block. I love verse 62. Why don't you just hang around till the ascension? You see that? Wouldn't you just please stay till the ascension? I'm telling you, I came from heaven. If you stay, you'll see me go back. Then you'll know. Stay. Verse 63, it's the Spirit who gives life. Holy Spirit, the flesh profits nothing. Oh, I love this. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. It's always the words. It's always the words. It's always the words. Listen, folks, if you're going to do evangelism, you have to speak the words of the gospel. It's the words. If anyone keeps my word, John 8, 51, he will never see death. It's the words. John chapter 12, verse 48, he who rejects me and doesn't receive my sayings, my words, my words, and not just mine, the word I spoke is what's going to judge him in the end, and the word that I spoke is just what the Father told me to speak. John 14, in the upper room, John 15, it's all about the words, believing the words, obeying the words. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you, your joy may be full. Salvation is about believing the words. Faith comes by what? Hearing message concerning Christ. Here's the issue, verse 64, there are some of you who don't believe. Some of you don't believe. And Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who didn't believe and who it was who would betray Him. You know what fascinates me about that? He knew from the beginning who wouldn't believe and yet He pled with all of them to believe.
they wouldn't believe. Over in chapter 8, verse 21 to 24, he says, if you don't believe, you'll die in your sins, and where I go, you'll never come. Believe, believe, believe. So, jump down to verse 66. As a result of this kind of talk, this message, these words, many of his disciples withdrew, were not walking with him anymore. Unbelief. Unwillingness to hear, to believe the words from heaven that they had heard, abandoning the Lord Jesus Christ. They re embraced their worldly interests. They left for good, the Greek phrase, ek tutu, from this time on, gone. They went out. That's the false disciples. Look at verses 67 to 69 at the true disciples. Brokenhearted Jesus, crushed, maybe even weeping as in Luke 19. He had offered them himself. He had been abandoned. He sits with a few who remain I think pensive, uh, exhausted, disappointed, out of his pain. So Jesus said to the twelve, you do not want to go away also, do you? Greek construction demands no answer. You're not going away, are you? I know you're not. I know who you are. I know you're not. Simon Peter, always the spokesman, answered him, I love this, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have what? What's the next? Words. You have words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you're the Holy One of God. Boy, this is an awful lot about human responsibility, isn't it? We have believed that you're the Holy One of God. By the way, that was one of Isaiah's favorite names for God, the the Holy One of Israel. And now in the incarnation, it becomes the name of Christ, the Holy One of God. It is here, and it is also in Mark 124, where it is a demon who says, I know you, the Holy One of God. Peter says, we know who you are. We know you. We know you're the Christ, the Son of God. We know you're the Holy One of God. True discipleship affirms faith in all the claims and all the truths that Jesus has ever made. They are the ones who receive eternal life. What a moment. What a precious moment. True believers affirm and declare themselves. And I think Peter clearly speaking for the rest. But it's just a brief thing, a brief pause, and immediately you come to verse 70, and the pathos of the chapter grips you again. Jesus answered them, did I myself not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? And he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. This is not intended to open up biographical studies of Judas. This is the final note on mass defection. We're not allowed to dwell even on the blessed confession very long, just a brief pause, and we're back into the pathos that dominates the text, the tragedy of false discipleship and mass defection. The words are not to be explored about Judas in some kind of a biographical way, only to make the final point of the whole chapter, expect antichrists, expect devils among those you disciple. Judas wouldn't even be exposed for six months. And he was so good at his hypocrisy that when Jesus said one was a traitor, they all thought it might be them. Two names appear at the end of the chapter, Peter and Judas, both drawn to Jesus, both personally called by Jesus, both taught by Jesus, both 
affirmed devotion to Jesus. Both were trained for ministry by Jesus and did ministry. Both taught Scripture. Both were taught Scripture in his small group. Both experienced the example, the gripping evidence of our Lord's heavenly perfection. Both saw the miracles every day. Both heard the Lord Jesus answer every theological question truthfully, completely, and clearly. Both were daily confronted with the nature of sin, death, judgment, and the need for repentance and grace. Both were told of the reality of hell and heaven. Both even preached the Lord Jesus as Son of God, Messiah, Savior. Both knew their sinfulness. Both experienced overwhelming guilt. Both gave themselves to Satan. Both took sides against the Lord. Both betrayed the Lord Jesus boldly, emphatically, and openly. Both were devastated by their betrayal. Both felt guilty about it. One, however, so honorable that in spite of his betrayal, some of you sitting here are named after him. The other one, so dishonorable that none of you are named after him. One ended a manic suicide, the other a martyred saint. Both were sorry. What's the difference? Peter, we, we've believed. We've believed. We've believed. For Peter, the words were life. He received them, believed them, obeyed them, rejoiced in them, and eventually preached them, didn't he? For Judas, the words were death. They killed his interest. They killed his ambition. They devastated his expectations. They overwhelmed him with angry resentment. It's always about the words. So warning the people in the church serious business in evangelism, warning the people sitting in churches that are collectively apostate, serious business, far greater punishment in hell for the reached than the unreached. Where do you go in this? This is painful, agonizing. Where did Jesus go? His heart is broken. I'm sure there were tears on his cheeks at this defection. Where does he go? He goes where you go, where I go. Verse 65. He was saying, this is the reason I said to you that no one can come to me unless it's been granted him from the Father. Where did he find his rest? found his rest in the sovereign, elective purposes of God. Without that, I don't think I could do this because I would tend to lay the failure at my own feet. It's just too much. He said, that's why I, that's why I said that no one can come to me unless it's been granted him from the Father. When did he say that? Back in verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. He'll hold with an eternal grip. Uh, for I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose none, but raise him up on the last day. Verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I'll raise him on the last day. I find my rest in the same place that the original Calvinist found his rest. This would have been a perfect moment for Jesus to harmonize human responsibility and divine sovereignty. And he doesn't say a word. Just leaves it there. Believe, 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 believe. Ah. 
How do I find peace in the midst of the defection? I rest in the purpose of God. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an incorruptible love. Amen.